recommendations for use of JE vaccine in consideration of these updated data and update the MMWR recommendations and reports. Presentations to ACIP since the work group was reformed have included new safety data, including a review of adverse events reported to VAERS over a four-year period from 2012 to 2016, and a presentation on post-marketing adverse event surveillance among US military personnel. Several presentations on updated vaccine immunogenicity data have also been given, including immunogenicity in adults aged 65 years of age and older, the accelerated zero and seven day dosing schedule, concomitant administration of JE vaccine with rabies vaccine, the duration of protection following a primary series and following a booster dose in adults, the duration of protection following a primary series in children, and data regarding need for a booster dose in children. And finally, an updated review of the epidemiology and risk of JE in US travellers. Current work group activities are focused on finalising a JE vaccine cost effectiveness analysis. To provide some background to this analysis, JE vaccine has been shown to be cost effective or cost saving for local populations in endemic countries where disease incidence is higher and substantially lower cost vaccines are used. No JE vaccine cost effectiveness studies have been conducted among travellers, and given the low incidence of disease among travellers and the high cost of vaccine, it's not expected that a JE vaccine would be cost effective for travellers. However, the rationale for conducting a JE vaccine cost effectiveness analysis is to provide perspective on the numbers needed to be vaccinated and cost per case averted, and to compare relative costs of vaccination for travellers with different itineraries and disease risk. To complete the remaining ACIP JE vaccine work group objectives, the following items will be addressed at one or more uh, upcoming ACIP meetings. A presentation of the cost effectiveness analysis, a review of the ACIP recommendations for use of JE vaccine in consideration of the updated safety, immunogenicity and traveller risk data, a grade analysis to update the analysis performed in 2013 when our paediatric JE vaccine recommendations were considered, and a presentation of a draft of an updated MMWR recommendations and reports. Finally, for ACIP's awareness, there are two JE vaccine submissions currently under review at FDA. Uh, firstly, FDA is assessing the safety and effectiveness of a booster dose in children, and secondly, data for the accelerated primary sh uh, schedule are under review. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Are there questions for Dr. Hills? Yes, Dr. Valanja. Is it uh, correct to say that under the vast majority of circumstances, the cost of the vaccine in the U.S. will be borne by the traveler as opposed to anyone else? Uh, we believe from um, uh, the information we have that in most cases it will be borne by the traveler. There are some companies that will um, uh, pay for their staff, um, but we don't believe it's covered by insurance in most cases. Dr. Romero. A um, question about the ACIP recommendation. So, uh, do we define um, what short term interval is for exposure and what the long term interval is, or is that left up to the, to the traveler and the physician? Right, so a longer term is a month or longer, and shorter term is under a month. Um, and then the consideration is both the shorter term travel with the risk activities. Other questions? Thank you very much for that great summary. Um, now we're going to go to vaccine supply with Dr. Santoli. And after that, we'll have public comment. So just a brief update related to a couple of vaccine supply issues. So first we'll talk a little bit about hepatitis A vaccine supply and then we'll switch over to hepatitis B vaccine supply update. So for adult hepatitis A vaccine, as this group I think is well aware, during 2017 there were large outbreaks 
of hepatitis A among adults in several large cities and that resulted in an increased demand for the vaccine and constrained supplies. In response, a number of actions were taken, including CDC working directly with public health officials in affected jurisdictions to provide guidance about how to best target vaccines in response to the local epidemiology, collaboration with manufacturers to understand options for managing supplies in the private sector and for increasing national supplies, the implementation of ordering controls in the public sector to support affected jurisdictions and to maintain an equitable jurisdiction of vaccine in unaffected jurisdictions, and increasing vaccine availability on CDC's adult vaccine contracts to support the management of ongoing and future outbreaks, as well as routine vaccination activities. Now, as available vaccine supplies have increased and progress has been made regarding the ongoing outbreaks, the public sector vaccine supply strategy has evolved. First, support for affected jurisdictions is ongoing in terms of technical assistance and vaccine supply as part of the outbreak response. And second, increased levels of vaccine supply have been made available for unaffected jurisdictions to facilitate routine vaccination activities and make modest amounts of vaccine available for small-scale outbreak response without awardees having to consult CDC. In addition, CDC and vaccine manufacturers are continuing to carefully monitor ongoing demand and usage of adult hepatitis A vaccine. And of note, um, there are not currently constraints for Twinrix, which is the combination hepatitis A, hepatitis B vaccine, or pediatric hepatitis A vaccine supply. Switching over to hepatitis B, for adult hepatitis B vaccine, Merck is not currently distributing its adult hepatitis B vaccine and will not be distributing the vaccine through the end of 2018. However, the dialysis formulation of hepatitis B vaccine is available. And GSK has sufficient supplies of their adult hepatitis B vaccine to address the anticipated gap in Merck's adult vaccine hepatitis, adult hepatitis B vaccine supply during this period. However, the preference for a specific presentation, so a vial versus a syringe, may not be met uniformly during this period. And then for pediatric hepatitis B vaccine, Merck is not currently distributing its pediatric hepatitis B vaccine, but anticipates resuming distribution in the beginning of April 2018. And GSK has sufficient supplies of their pediatric hepatitis B vaccine to address the anticipated gap in Merck's pediatric hepatitis B vaccine supply during the period. And as similar with the, to the adult vaccine, the preferences for a specific presentation, vial versus syringe, may not be uniformly met during the period. And then just that, that was the updates, but just to remind you that we do have a vaccine supply page that we keep updated. We'll be updating that in sync with all of the updates that we make at this meeting and during other meetings. And it's a good link to bookmark. Thank you, Dr. Santoli. Any questions? And Jeannie, can you give us an update on the MMR BFC resolution? Oh, so to go back to an earlier uh, question that came up, the um, MMR the VFC resolution for MMR and varicella does include the use of MMR vaccine for those six months and up in the setting of an outbreak and for preparation for international travel. So thank you. There. Thank you both. That's great. Any other questions for Dr. Santoli? All right, seeing none, I think we'll move on to public comment. I think Dr. Cohn has the list. Great. Um, so we have several people who are signed up for public comment. I'm gonna call you guys in order. Um, by which you signed up. So the first is um, Ms. Crystal Grindley, then um, Raul Estures, I apologize if I'm pronouncing names wrong, um, Dr. Scott, Scott Halstead, um, and Dr. Uh, Leonard Friedland. So the first is Ms. Grindley. Good morning. My name is Crystal Beecham Grindley, and I'm a survivor of meningococcal disease and an advocate with the National Meningitis Association. 
In 2003, I contacted meningococcal disease as a college junior at the University of New Orleans at a time when the meningococcal vaccine was not mandatory for college students in the state of Louisiana. In a few short hours, I went from being an excited college student to a very scared, very sick patient, uncertain of my future. I was hospitalized for several weeks, and although my road to recovery was long, and I suffered permanent hearing loss, liver damage, muscle paralysis, and other lifelong consequences of the disease, I'm truly one of the lucky ones because we know that many who contract meningococcal disease ultimately die from it, and many others will have amputated limbs, brain damage, and other serious complications. My parents were strong advocates for my health, and when I was a teenager, they made me get my routine immunizations um, every time that they were up for me to get them, but I did, however, skip the meningococcal vaccine. It was not routinely recommended to me at the time when I went to get my uh, vaccines, and so I did not receive it, and that's a decision that I ultimately re regret. I convinced myself that meningococcal disease was something that no one really got, and certainly something that I would never contract but my stories and the stories of countless others prove otherwise. Many teens feel invincible like I did at the time, but they're not. This is why I think that a permissive recommendation, a recommendation on a potentially life-saving vaccine just isn't strong enough. My experience with meningococcal disease showed me what a crucial role healthcare professionals play in helping individuals make personal health decisions. And if a healthcare professional had made a strong recommendation for me for the meningococcal vaccines and told me that they weren't negotiable, my outcome may have been a lot different. My experience also has driven home the importance of vaccines as tools for personal and public health. I advocate on a daily basis for adolescents and young adults to get vaccinated against men meningococcal disease, and I am equally as passionate, um, making sure that folks in my community get um, vaccinated for their influenza vaccine as well. Not only do we need to protect ourselves, but we have an obligation to protect those that may be immunocompromised as well. As an NMA advocate, I look at our map of meningococcal disease of outbreaks on college campuses, and I've brought a few that are outside. And I look at this map and I'm alarmed. The number of cases, particularly meningitis B, on uh, college campuses just keeps on growing. And we need to prioritize the administration of both kinds of vaccines to help protect all of us from meningococcal disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Raul Estoras, is there, are you still wanting to make a comment? can go on to Dr. Scott Halstead. Uh, good afternoon. Just a couple of remarks on <coughs> risk to Japanese encephalitis to complement uh, Susan Hill's remarks. Uh, I, I realize that uh, looking at the map of the globe, uh, the uh, purple area didn't look so big, but this really is one of the very largest uh, global zoonoses, and it's important to think of Japanese encephalitis as a zoonosis. Um, the the, uh, the 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 point. Sorry, <laughs> um, the when, when I. Uh, studied the, the zoonosis in Japan prior to the uh, development of vaccines. Uh, people were uh, largely immune when they became adults, and that uh, in indicates that probably the uh, transmission rate every year was between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, since those days, people have both moved into cities and also there have been vaccines. So uh, we can't use uh, human uh, incidence as a measure of the dimension and intensity of this zoonosis. Japanese encephalitis really resembles West Nile in that uh, uh, not only is this a, a zoonotic disease of uh, birds, but it's widespread in, in in a large number of other species. For example, when I was in Japan, we, we found that every 
amphibian and reptile and even bats were were infected and uh, so the the dimensions of the zoonosis and in, in the uh, the niches that it that it occupies are really quite profound uh, given this risk the, the fact that uh, Asia is, is highly populated and and uh, and visited it really is without any monitoring there's nobody really monitoring uh, the dimensions of the zoonoses which of course vary some area to area and year to year and season to season uh, it really is uh, prudent to provide uh, immunization protection to people that enter into this sort of unknown zoonotic adventure if you will so uh, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the sort of uh, hands-off approach to uh, the vaccine recommendation for, for travelers because I think that, that almost anybody who travels outside of a shepherded group and goes to Asia, and you know, people say season, well it's true in northern uh, Asia there is there's seasonality, but in South and Southeast Asia, there's not, not much seasonality. So people who are visiting these countries who wander away from urban areas don't have to go very far to actually be uh, in zoonotic areas. You know, Culex tritinia ricus is a, a rice paddy breeding mosquito. It's a very e efficient uh, transitional mosquito because it both intersects with the zoonotic cycle and in the human cycle. So uh, I'm very encouraged that we have a, an effective, safe, and uh, efficient uh, Japanese encephalitis vaccine. My suspicion, frankly, is that uh, it's going to, a single course of vaccine will actually last a lifetime because, uh, you know, what you're doing in Japanese encephalitis is protecting the brain. And, to do that, the, vi the virus has to enter the body, replicate, and then become viremic, as far as we know. So this gives the body a chance, if, it, if you have immunological memory, to provide uh, an antibody barrier. So I, I think this is a, uh, a breakthrough vaccine in the sense it's efficient and, and non-reactogenic, and uh, that we ought to, we ought to be um, more proactive, perhaps, in trying to get this vaccine into people's arms. I realize that the, that the rate, historical rate of, of encephalitis among vi visitors from outside of Asia is quite low, but this, this is a, a zoonosis that's, that's not going anywhere. It's going to be there forever, and I think we need to think long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for reminding us that the world is small and we need to think about this carefully. Thank you. So now we have Dr. Friedland. And um, I have for also forgot to mention Frankie um, Milley has also signed up if you would like to speak after Dr. Friedland. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Leonard Friedland from GSK Vaccines. I'd like to take the opportunity to provide public comment in two topics that were discussed today, meningococcus and zoster. I'll start with meningococcus. It's a very important area that we really understand all the data. Just a few comments on duration and around waning immunity. Uh, much more data is being generated with all of the meningococcal vaccines at GSK. We have data now at persistence at two years, at four years, at seven years, which we look forward to reviewing with the committee. And I think it's important to mention that when we, when we look at immunogenicity, we're reporting antibody levels. But it's become, I think, quite clear that HSBA underestimates immunity to meningococcus, and I think we really need to understand how the body responds immunologically to MenB vaccines and what is protective. With regarding uh, coverage, I do want to mention that GSK worked with CDC and published a recent paper demonstrating that uh, Bexero vaccine provides 91% coverage against strains circulating in the United States in a recent publication in November 2017. Also, it's important uh, to mention 
around uh, safety. There was a comment on safety. The post-marketing experience for Vexero is very similar to that in the clinical trials. And in the United Kingdom, where the vaccine is being used routinely for infants, there are over 2 million infants that have now received the vaccine. This is a very large and growing safety database. And lastly, on meningococcus, around the carrot study that was mentioned, 56,000 adolescents, 15 to 18 year old, are being studied in Australia to investigate carriage for men B vaccination, Vexero particularly. Now on to Zoster, if I may just briefly, Dr. Freihofer, just to respond to your comments. Shingrix can be ordered in different ways through wholesalers, through distributors, and through a GSK direct ordering site called gsk.com. GSK.com went through an SAP implementation and we notified all of our customers that the site would be down for a short period of time. Just yesterday, all customers on GSK Direct were notified the site will be back up on Monday. And so what you're referring to is for those who ordered directly from GSK, that will be back up on Monday. The websites are all up and running, providing information. And around information, thank you, Dr. Massonier, for pointing out to all of our professional society partners how important it is to get out the right information around proper dosing, storage, administration, and reconstitution of Shingrix. So thank you very much for socializing that information so that people get this vaccine the proper way and can benefit. Thank you. Thank you. And last we have, last but certainly Mr. not Frank least. Mr. Millie? Hi, I am Frankie Millie. And my only child died with meningococcal disease at the age of 18. He just graduated high school, just reached his pro golf career. And on Father's Day, he became ill with a fever and an earache. And 14 hours later, he laid on an emergency room table with blood literally coming from every orifice of his body. The medical examiner told me had Ryan lived, he would have been blind, deaf. His adrenal glands had ruptured, his kidneys had ruptured. He would have lost all four extremities. Ryan was a golfer. He loved to dance. He was an amazing young man. He wanted to own his own golf club and call it Hackwood. Since Ryan's death, I've spent the last almost 20 years now trying to make sure that other families don't have to go through what we did and some of the kids that we work with that have no legs, no arms, they've lost their faces, they've had the kidney transplants, they take 26 plus pills a day just to replace what the adrenal glands are supposed to be doing. They have severe mental illness, they suffer learning disabilities, the families are going bankrupt, they end a divorce, suicide, it's horrible. And when you throw, you know, when you, when you throw percentage rates around, you need to remember, this is 1%, that 1%. He was a real person. He was my only child. This disease took away my right to ever be a grandparent, to be the parent at a wedding, and to have his comfort in my old age. I have worked with this committee and spoken to this committee over the years. And I want to commend you because this is often a thankless job that you do. And it's not, it's not recognized the work that this committee does in this country and around the world. And I'm proud to, to stand here today with you guys. Because of what you did with Men C4 years ago, we are seeing a decline. Kids aren't dying anymore for this, but they are dying and they are still having it, but it's a lot better. We've seen the carriage rate go down immensely. I don't have to talk to those moms that are in an emergency room or those dads. I don't have to, I'm li I don't have to listen to those parents who call me all hours of the night telling me that their child is so mentally ill and they can't get the help they need. I know with all of my heart that this committee moving forward is going to do the right thing when it comes to this disease because you do your homework and you're willing to listen. You're willing to listen to us all before you make those decisions. I commend you and I look forward to a time when I don't have to do this anymore. I'm 65. I'm ready to go sit on the lake and retire. 
and not have to talk about Ryan dying every day of my life. But I do want to thank you all. You guys rock. And we want to thank you. We commend the work you do as well. Is there any further public comment? With that, I think we are adjourned. We will see you in June. Thank you all, and safe travels. <laughs>